Amen. This evening we're continuing through Psalm 119. This is a very long psalm, but it is one that, uh, again, shows us various uh, vistas, various views of the commandments and how much we ought to love them and many reasons why we should love them. And I'd like to read for you another one of these eight-verse uh, portions, uh, verses 129 through 136. And again, asking ourselves the question this evening, how much should you love these commandments? Actually, we're going to see we should love them as much as we love God Himself. And we should love Him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So let's read this portion of Scripture. Beginning in verse 129, the psalmist writes, Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul observes them. The unfolding of your words gives light, it gives understanding to the simple. I opened my mouth wide and panted, for I longed for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me after your manner with those who love your name. Establish my footsteps in your word, and do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from the oppression of man, that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant, and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of water, because they do not keep your law." Now, again, we're going to want to see something of what this means from the psalmist's perspective, but the thing that's most important is that we see how it applies to us because the Word of God was given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, not just for the people at that time, but for the church of all ages. It has application to us as well. Now, what I'd like to do is tie it together with what we saw this morning. Remember, this morning we were thinking about what it means to live in the presence of God. Remember, we saw that He is with you. God is everywhere. God is omnipresent, which means everywhere present at once. He is infinite. With regard to time, He is eternal. With regard to strength, He is almighty. With regard to knowledge, He knows all things. Even before we speak, He knows every word we're going to speak. But He is also infinite with regard to space. He is everywhere at the same time. Not a small little particle that moves so fast it's everywhere in the universe but he is this infinite God is present in every point in space with his entire being, which means that he is with you. As we saw, he's all around you. If you're a believer, he also dwells in you by his Holy Spirit. And of course, um, well, if you have trusted Jesus Christ and he does dwell in you, um, he is in you for good and with you for good. Now again, since he is with you, it will help you, as we saw this morning, to see this and to acknowledge it and to live accordingly. It should make a difference in the way that you live. It should make a difference in the way that I live. Uh, one of the things it should do is, is it should give you comfort uh, in knowing that He is with you to bless you, even as Jesus said to His disciples when He sent them out to make disciples of all the nations, that He would be with them to the end of the age. He wouldn't leave them or forsake them. He wouldn't abandon them, but He would be there to help them that He is with you to give you courage as you seek to obey Him in a world that is becoming, we would say, increasingly hostile against Christian principles, against God, because of the God of this world, because of Satan, uh, because of that fallen angel that um, is seeking to overthrow what God does. But we also saw that, that understanding that God is everywhere and that He is with you also helps you to live more carefully, to make more careful choices, to do what is right rather than what is wrong, knowing that He is present to see you. And again, I would remind you, even if He didn't see you, even if He wasn't here to see you, He would still know because He knows all things. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows every decision you're going to make, every thought that you think, uh, even before you were born. And everyone who has ever lived, that's how great He is. But His presence and the fact that He sees means that every choice that we make is made in His presence before His eyes, just as though we were standing before the throne of God in heaven. 
Now, on this third point, again, the fact that He sees you, realizing that He sees you uh, is one reason why you should keep the commandments, the fear of the Lord, and the fact that, you know, God is, if, if you haven't trusted Him, is going to bring every uh, bad decision, every sinful decision into judgment against you. But if you do know Him, He's going to take, of course, and discipline you for those bad choices. But, of course, He also sees the good ones. But the fear of the Lord is one of those motives. It'll help you think twice about choosing a direction that isn't good. But this evening, we're going to be reminded of another motive and the primary motive, and that is love. This is, again, what the writer of this psalm is centering on in this particular section as he continues to express his own great love and desire for God's commandments. The things that show your love to Him and to those around you. That's what the commandments are all about. Now, this evening, I want us to be challenged by these expressions from His heart to examine our own hearts, to see whether this is what we are like, and to encourage us that if this is what we are like, to nurture that love, because this is actually what the Lord calls us to do, even as He calls us to love Him with our whole being. He also calls us to love His commandments in the same way because they are expression of that same thing, as I mentioned before, that we love in God, and that is His love for what is right, His love for what is good. So this evening, I want us to consider five things, and five may sound like a lot, but we're going to just consider them briefly. First of all, how you should view the commandments. Secondly, why you should love them. Thirdly, how strongly then you should desire to understand them. Fourthly, what you should ask God in prayer based on that desire. And then fifthly, how you should view those who don't keep the commandments. So first of all, how should you view the commandments? Well, you should view them just as the psalmist did. Remember, the psalmist was merely a man like the rest of us, but he was a man who was saved by the grace of God. He was one who believed God, one who had the Spirit of God living within him by faith. When you look at the commandments, you should have basically the same, um, well, you should have the same view of them as the psalmist did because if you've trusted Christ, you have the same Spirit. First of all, your heart should be filled with wonder. He writes in verse 129, your testimonies are wonderful. Now, what he means here by wonderful isn't exactly what we mean by wonderful because wonderful actually means full of wonder. And we think of it, oh, that's nice, you know, it's really good. And, and it is true that that is kind of what he means. But what it means is they're so good that they fill his heart with awe. They fill him with wonder. It's, it's hard for him to comprehend or to fathom, fathom them, just the beauty of them, not what they're saying but all that they mean, all that they meant, all they mean to us today. They're so simple, and yet they're so profound. They describe a perfect standard of what is right and what is wrong. They give to us a rule of conduct that is at the same time fair and loving to all. Everything they said or say is so right. Everything that they say is so good, not only for the psalmist, and not only for all those around him, but also, of course, for God, because they are honoring to him. So as he thinks about just how perfect a standard this is, his heart is just filled with wonder. And not surprisingly, when he saw how wonderful they are, he responded in the only way one can, if you truly find them to be wonderful, by trying to live up to them, up to what they said. You're, you're, he says, your testimonies are wonderful, therefore, my soul observes them. Now we say, well, what's, what's unique about that? What's so strange about that? Well, the interesting thing is the Bible tells us that those who don't love God will do just the opposite. They don't see the wonder of His commandments. When they look at His commandments, they hate them. They don't want to obey them. They try to do everything they can to work around them, kind of do an end run, how they can get what they want and somehow still think that they're doing what God wants. Paul says that apart from God's goodness and His mercy to us, 
that there is none who does good, there's not even one, that our hearts are so steeled against God that we cannot and we will not submit to His law. And the thing that makes that really bad and really evil is the fact that His law is the perfect expression of love. It's perfect. It's good. And the fact that we would hate that just shows the condition of our hearts. Now, the Spirit of God changed that for us if we've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God changed our view. He didn't really change the commandments at all, but He simply enabled us to see what they were really like and to see what it is they really commanded and to see that they really were good. The Spirit of God is the one who opens our eyes and He shows us not only how beautiful Jesus is as a Savior, but at the same time shows us how beautiful this law is so that at the same time you want to embrace Jesus Christ as your Savior from sin, you also gladly submit to Him as Lord, not because He forces you, but because that's what you want to do. You see the beauty of His ways and you want to go that way. Now, adding this to what we saw this morning with regard to the presence of God, you obey God because He is near, you obey God because He sees, you obey God because of the fear of the Lord, and you, you know what it is that you know, He says He will do to those who, who really break His commandments, and what that means is for those who hate others and who hate Him. And even when we do that as believers, which we can, His discipline, so we keep them for those reasons. But the main reason you keep them is because you really do love Him and you really do love His commandments and that is really what you want to do. So His commandments are wonderful, which is why we observe them. Now, are there any other reasons why in this passage you might love them? Well, the psalmist continues in verse 130, the unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple which basically means as they're read and as they're explained, it, it helps dispel our ignorance. You know, light in the Bible refers to knowledge. You know, we, we talk about that knowledge in kind of the same way, you know, and we're trying to figure something out and all of a sudden this light bulb appears, you know, over the head, ding, you know, and the light comes on. Well, you've just received some light. Now you understand. Now you see. Well, basically the Bible uses it the same way. Light is a metaphor for the knowledge of what is good and what is right. Darkness, on the other hand, refers to ignorance. Ignorance of what is right, ignorance of what is good. Those who walk in ignorance basically think they know what's right and maybe even think they're doing what's right, but they're actually doing what's wrong. Solomon writes in Proverbs 4.19, the way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. Now, the Bible says we were all born in darkness. We used to walk around in darkness, grope around in the dark. We didn't know where we were going, and we were actually heading toward destruction. That's when you didn't know Jesus, and you were blinded by the God of this world and under God's wrath, as Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2. But somebody came to you and unfolded the words of God and gave you light through the Word. They shared the gospel. In, in all of its simplicity. It's really not difficult at all to understand. God revealed Himself to you through that gospel and He gave you light. He showed you what you were doing that was wrong and turned you from that wrong, put within you a, a heart that loved what was right so that you began to walk in the right way. And now you love His Word. You love His law. Now you want to know it better so that you can live it. You know, we don't want to just know it so we can explain it to other people and tell everybody, you know, just how much knowledge we have, but you want to know it so that you may keep it, so that you may honor Him and love Him, because that's how you love the Lord. Jesus said on one occasion, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is what Jesus meant when He said that He came that we might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. He came to free you from bondage to sin. He came to bring you out of that darkness and bring you into the light, to free you from sin. And Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And now that you are free from that darkness, you don't 
want to return to that darkness again. You want the light so that you can walk in the light and honor the Lord. Now, in light of this, how strong should your desire be to learn more of what God has to tell you in His law? How much of this light should you desire? Well, your desire should be something like that of this man. Look at what he says in verse 131. I opened my mouth wide and panted, for I longed for your commandments. Now, we already saw something about this panting, didn't we, uh, in our meditation and our call to worship, how the psalmist hungered and thirsted, how he, he panted uh, like the deer for the water brooks. He, his soul was thirsting and panting after God. Now, this is the kind of desire you should have for God, is to pant for Him, to desire Him with that kind of strength. This is the kind of desire you should have for the law of God. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. But what is the standard of righteousness but what God says in His law? Now, what does He mean, hungering and thirsting? What is He talking about here, panting? Well, what do you do when you're hungry and how do you feel? How do you feel when you're thirsty and when you're parched? I know how I feel and I imagine you're probably the same, but you feel almost like this, this something's taking your breath away. You, you have this panting, as it were, because you have this desire for something. You have this desire for food because you're hungry. You have this desire to drink because you're thirsty. And you know when there's anything that you want, and you want it really badly, when your desire is strong, it creates a thirst in your soul that makes you pant after that thing. You almost feel in a certain sense like you're suffocating. I'm going to suffocate unless I can have what this thing is that I want. Well, the psalmist is saying that is how you should desire to know and obey God. Well, maybe you've experienced something like this in your life. I hope you have, at least at some point. But one question that perhaps we should ask ourselves is, why don't we experience it more than we do? Well, I think the main reason is because your heart can easily be divided, divided between God and something else between God and the world, between God and the things God made. Now, when a river divides, you know that each of its streams has less water and it becomes less powerful. The same thing is true with regard to the affections of your heart when they're divided between God and anything else. It weakens the love that you have that should be flowing out towards God. And to the degree that your heart is divided between God and other things, to that degree, your desire for God is weakened so that you're not having that panting of soul because all your affection is not directed toward Him. And when it's not directed toward Him, neither will it be directed towards His law. And so what should you do about this? Well, that's the fourth point. You need to pray. That's what this man did. He prayed. Verse 132, turn to me and be gracious to me. After, man, after your manner with those who love your name. Now, why did the psalmist pray? Well, he, it's because he knew that he didn't, just as you don't and I don't, have the strength that, that we need to bring the channels of our heart's affections together the way they need to be. You need God's grace. And the only way you can get it is by asking. You need to ask Him. Ask the Lord for His grace to give you that desire and to take all the avenues, all the channels in which your affections flow out and direct them all towards Him. Ask the Lord, and if you desire that truly, God will help you. Whenever you ask anything according to His will, Jesus says He hears you and He will give it to you. Now, you can pray generally and you can pray more specifically. Look at verse 133. He says, establish my footsteps in your word. And do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. In other words, set me free from all my sins, from all bondage to sin, from anything that has a hold on my heart, everything that shouldn't have a hold on my heart. Pray that God would give you an undivided heart that is intent on following Him. That's what it means, establish my footsteps in your word as you walk through life, that you obey Him, 
in everything. That's what your desire should be. That's what you need to pray for. Now, this man also prayed that God would free him from the attacks of, of his enemies. And here, of course, he's referring to the oppression of man, his physical enemies. But you know, whenever people are attacking you, it also opens the door to spiritual oppression. He wanted to be free from these things so that he could obey God better. Redeem me, he says, from the oppression of man, that I may keep your precepts. As we think about all the different things going on in our society and how uh, living for what the Lord says is right is, is bringing persecution and oppression. I think we can understand something about this. Free me from the oppression of man that I may keep your precepts or your commandments. So you need to pray that the Lord would do that for you as well and continue to allow us the freedom to obey the Lord and that He would also free you from those enemies that wage spiritual warfare against your soul, that seek to divide your heart so that you won't love God and won't desire His commandments the way you should. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. All of these things injure you, injure others, and offend God. They are bad for you. They divide your heart from the Lord and cause you to love Him less. They are enemies. You need to pray that the Lord would free you from them so that you might keep His Word. And you need to pray that the Lord would bless you in your efforts to understand what it is that He wants you to do. Again, as this man did, look at verse 135, make your face shine upon your servant, which is basically lift up your countenance or bless your servant and teach me your statutes. Now, you know, as this man did, that God's law is wonderful. You know it can make you wise in godly living. It gives light to the simple. Your soul hungers and thirsts to know it more, and so you should pray that the Lord would free you from everything that you allow in your life that weakens that love and that He would give you an undivided heart. Now, if you know Jesus Christ and you pray for this, He will give it to you. But if you don't know Jesus, you first need to trust Him. Uh, Jesus, well, Jesus Himself is actually the one who said John 3.16, which is the most famous and, and probably the most well-known verse in all the Bible, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We know from the Scripture to believe in Him means to trust Him, to trust Him alone to save you, to trust in, in His obedience, what He did as He perfectly obeyed His Father, to trust in His death on the cross to pay for your sins. You have to place your whole hope of heaven on Him and on His work alone. And of course, you also need that evidence in your life that you truly have trusted Jesus, and that is turning from your sins and following after Him, obeying Him, obeying His commandments, hungering and thirsting for them, panting for them like the psalmist did. Now, if you will trust Jesus, not only will He forgive you, and not only will He guarantee you a place in heaven, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. He was speaking with His disciples, and if I go, I will come again and receive you to Myself. But He will also give you the power to keep His commandments. That's not something you do to get into heaven. It's the evidence that the Lord has saved you, is that you desire to keep them because He's put His love in your heart. And now you love Him and you love others, and so you keep the commandments. Now, finally, what should you feel towards those who don't keep God's commandments? That shouldn't be hard to figure out because, you know, the... The two greatest commandments are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second is, like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So if you see your neighbor not keeping the commandments of God and you love him, what are you going to do? Well, you should do, of course, what the psalmist did. He says, my eyes shed streams of water because they do not keep your law. Now, I know the tendency is to hate those who... Don't keep the commandments of God, especially those who really are, are really evil, as it were, really bad and really break them a lot, and more particularly, those who, in breaking their commandments, are actually hurting you. But what does Jesus say? 
Luke 6, 27. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Now, did Jesus tell you and me to do something he himself wasn't willing to do? Of course not. Jesus did this perfectly. When he was on the cross, what did he do? He prayed for his enemies, for those who had betrayed him, for those who had disowned him, for those who handed him over to the Romans to be tried and condemned, for those who handed him over to be crucified, for those who crucified him. He prayed for them. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I think we see something of that in, in the psalmist here, the writer of this psalm, because far from hating those who were disobeying God, he felt compassion for them. My eyes shed streams of water. Basically, he's crying, weeping, because they do not keep your law, not his eyes, but his oppressors who are oppressing him. He was feeling compassion for his enemies. Now, we do know from what we've read in the psalm before, and in this same psalm, there is a sense that you're going to be angry uh, with those who break God's law, not only because they're injuring you, but because they're dishonoring the one that you love more than anything else. But there's another sense in which you will feel compassion for them because of, you know what's going to happen to them if they don't repent and turn to Jesus. The Bible says that they will have to pay for every single one of their sins, and they will suffer in hell forever for them. They will never cease to exist, but always be tormented. Because sins committed against God are infinitely serious sins, because He is infinitely worthy. Now, the Bible says God doesn't delight in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from their evil ways and be saved. We need to have that same heart. So how do you feel towards those who are outside of Christ? Do you feel as the psalmist? Do you have the heart of Christ? Do you weep for them, knowing what's going to happen to them? Seems like the weeping doesn't really begin until they die and they're gone and they're lost and we know they are, it's too late. But knowing what's going to happen to them, are you concerned? And are you reaching out to them with the gospel? That's really what the, the work of the church is, to try to reach out to others, to give them the message that God uses to save. You have that message. God has given it to you. That's the message that you heard, the message that enlightened you, uh, the message that enabled you to, by God's grace, embrace Jesus Christ, to trust Him and to turn from your sins. You have that gospel. And you can share it with them. That's what God wants you to do. So if you find His law to be wonderful, if you find His law to be enlightening, if you hunger and you thirst, keep it as the psalmist did. If you pray that God will establish your footsteps in His Word, pray that He would help you to obey this command as well because this is a part of His commandment to us. Go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. Be ready at all times to give a reason for the hope that is within you, with gentleness and with meekness. The Lord wants us to share that gospel with others. Pray that He would help you obey this commandment. If you know Christ, if you are His child, you know that that's what you want to do. So you need to seek by His grace to do it. May the Lord grant us His mercy to be able to do just that. Let's bow in a moment of silent prayer and let's ask that the Lord would take His Word and would help us to understand it, to help us not to